These next three parables that we will consider in our study of the parables of Jesus were not distant in time from the previous two that we looked at, but there were several momentous things that had occurred between the telling of these parables. Uh, Alfred Adersheim makes this observation in The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. He wrote, again, we must bear in mind that between the parable of Dives and Lazarus and that of the unjust judge, not indeed a greater interval of time, but most momentous events had intervened. These were the visit of Jesus to Bethany, the raising of Lazarus, the Jerusalem council against Christ, the flight to Ephraim and a brief stay and preaching there, and the commencement of his last journey to Jerusalem. During this last slow journey from the borders of Galilee to Jerusalem, we suppose the discourses and the parables about the coming of the Son of Man to have been spoken. And although such utterances will be considered in connection with Christ's later full discourses about the last things, we readily perceive, even at this stage, how when he set his face towards Jerusalem, there to be offered up, thoughts and words concerning the end may have entered into all of his teaching and so have given occasion for the questions of the Pharisees and disciples and for the answers of Christ alike by both discourse and by parable. So in this study, we will consider the parable of the unjust judge, the Pharisee and the publican, and the unmerciful servant. Let's read from Luke chapter 18, uh, verses 1 through 8, the parable of the unjust judge. Then he spoke a parable to them that men ought always to pray and not lose heart, saying, There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man, now, there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward, he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? 
This parable is often referred to as the parable of the persistent widow, but we have designated it the parable of the unjust judge. It is a mistake to interpret this parable as teaching just as the widow persisted until she got what she wanted, that the disciples should just persist in prayer and keep asking until they got what they wanted. It's wrong to suppose that God will only hear us because of our repetitious prayers and our many words. It is not insistence in prayer that is the cause of its answer, but rather it is the faithful God who hears and answers us. And this is the, a case of reasoning from the lesser to the greater in this parable. If the widow was persistent with a human and unjust judge because she knew it would procure her object, how much more should we continue in prayer to our God who is divine and has our cause at heart even though he may delay sometimes because that is in our best interest. The real contrast in this parable is between the human unjust judge and the divine God who judges all things fairly and righteously. The general principle of the parable is that the disciples should always pray and he also states the opposite when he says, and not to lose heart, that is to grow faint or to grow weary. The word always, as it's used in this parable, should not be understood to rep in respect of time as if it means continuously without ever stopping. Rather, it should be taken in the sense of praying at all times, no matter what the circumstances, even when things look hopeless. Edersheim again says, this rule applies primarily to that weariness which might lead to the cessation of prayer for the coming of the Lord or of expectancy of it during the long period when it seems as if he delayed his return, nay, as if increasingly there were no likelihood of it. This widow's case seems to be one that was not likely to receive a fair hearing before an unconcerned judge who feared not God and was not concerned with man. The last few verses of this parable refer to the coming of the Son of Man as an answer to the prayers of the elect, that is, the church, in regard to his coming to set things right. A scoffing world hurls insults at the saints, as the Apostle Peter writes in 2 Peter 3, verses 1 through 7, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will one day be vindicated by a righteous and powerful God instead of being vilified and ridiculed by a ruthless and unbelieving world. This parable of the unjust judge reminds us that our God is just and he judges righteously. And even though some, he may delay his coming, 
and he may delay his answers at times, yet one day he will set all things right. Next, let's read from uh, Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, the parable of the publican, or the Pharisee and the publican. Also, he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This parable is not one so much about unrighteousness as it is one about self-righteousness. While the parable of the unjust judge teaches us concerning continuing in prayer, this parable teaches us about humility in prayer, and it is about our attitudes. This is a parable about our attitudes toward ourselves and toward others. These two men who come to the temple to pray represent for us two religious extremes in Judaism. Most Jews who observed these two coming to the temple would have believed that the Pharisee would be exalted above this lowly publican. In fact, this is even how the public or the Pharisee himself observed the situation. However, as we have noted in our study of some of the parables before, God does not see things the way men see them. And this same contrast may be observed in this parable of uh, the rich man and Lazarus that is observed in this parable. On the earth, before men, one set of values prevails, but when we come before God, we are faced with a different set of values. We are led to wonder in this parable if the Pharisee was indeed thankful as he said he was, because thankfulness implies a gift and the idea that what we have is ours because of what someone else has done for us. When we realize this, it should lead us to humility of mind and not to boastfulness as we see in the case of this Pharisee. The attitude of the Pharisee is seen in this prayer of one of the rabbis. I thank thee, O Lord, my God, that thou hast put my part with those who sit in the academy and not with those who sit at the corners, that is, the money changers and traders. For I rise early and they rise early. I rise early to the words of the law and they to vain things. I labor and they labor. I labor and receive a reward. They labor and receive no reward. I run and they run. I run to the life of the world to come and they to the pit of destruction. This is also like the boastful spirit of Rabbi Simeon ben Yochai who said, if there were only two righteous men in the world, me and my son are they. And if only one, it is I. It is possible that this Pharisee had been guilty of some of the very things of which he accused the publican and the others. It is obvious 
There was no confession of fault by the Pharisee. He could only see that he was better than the publican. And in doing this, he was making an unwise comparison. The Apostle Paul admonishes us in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. At six feet four inches, I may feel tall compared to my neighbor who is five foot ten, but then a man six foot ten comes along and completely dwarfs me. It is unwise to compare my righteousness with that of my neighbor. The only safe thing to do is to judge my goodness by what is revealed in God's word. And when we use this standard, the standard of God's world, we find that we are all sinners in need of a savior. This Pharisee is not blamed for his thankfulness or for any good that he had done, whether it was imaginary or real. And the publican's prayer is not answered because he was a sinner. In both cases, what decides the acceptance or the rejection of the prayer is whether or not it is really prayer. The Pharisee retains the righteousness which he claimed for himself, whatever its value may be, and the publican receives the righteousness for which he asks in his humble confession. And once more in this parable, we see the contrast between what is right in the sight of men and what is right in the sight of God. This Pharisee felt no need, and so he uttered no petition. On the other hand, the publican felt only need, and he uttered only petition and confession. And so in this parable, again, we see the comparison between the self-righteous older brother and the pardoned prodigal of the parable of the prodigal son. And we see the loving concern of the shepherd for the one sheep that was lost that we studied about in the, the uh, lost sheep. He who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the great lesson of this parable of the publican and the Pharisee. Next, we turn to Matthew's gospel, chapter 18, verses 21 through 35, where we read the parable of the unmerciful servant. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not just seven times, but 77 times. Because of this, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlements, a debtor was brought to him, owing him 10,000 talents. Since the man was unable to pay, the master ordered that he be sold to pay his debt along with his wife and children and everything he owned. Then the servant fell on his knees before him. Have patience with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. His master had compassion on him, forgave his debt, and released him. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe me. So his fellow servant fell down and begged him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay his debt. When his fellow servants saw what had happened, 
they were greatly distressed and they went and recounted all this to their master. Then the master summoned him and declared, You wicked servant, I forgave all your debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should repay all that he owed. That is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. The connection between this parable and that of the Pharisee and publican lies in the fact that Pharisaic self-righteousness and contempt for others may easily lead to unforgiveness and unmercifulness, which are not compatible with a sense of our own need of divine mercy and forgiveness. These servants that are mentioned in this parable were probably governors of provinces or perhaps men in charge of revenue and finances. And somehow one servant had mishandled funds in such a way that he wound up with a huge debt. It was a common practice at that time to sell men into slavery along with their families to settle debts. But what is essential in this parable is the great debt that he owed. Because this is an accurate representation of our relationship to God. It is a debt that we cannot afford to pay. When we in humble repentance cast ourselves at God's feet in obedient submission, he is ready to not only release us from punishment, but also to forgive us the entire debt. And so now we find ourselves in a new relationship with God, which must eventually be the foundation and the rule for the new relationship that we have towards our fellow servants as well. And this brings us to a new chapter in the story of this debtor. He now must test his new found forgiveness with one of his fellow servants who owes him just a small sum compared to what he had owed his master. He fails the test. He is brutal and unmerciful to his fellow servant, demanding that he pay the entire sum immediately. And when he begs him and he doesn't pay, he has him thrown into prison until the debt could be paid. The unreasonableness and even wickedness of his actions are obvious. Even his fellow servants know that his behavior is unkind and not in keeping with the forgiveness that he had received himself from the master. The master calls him once again and condemns him for his unmerciful and unkind spirit. He is put in the harshest part of the prison in order to remain there until he can pay his entire debt to the master. And under the circumstances, we understand that this will be forever because he cannot repay this debt ever. The preface to this parable is the question by the Apostle Peter, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I say not to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Jesus was not trying to give us an exact number of times to forgive. The Bible consistently teaches that in order to for be forgiven, we must forgive others also. Jesus taught this in the prayer that he taught his disciples to pray in the Lord's Prayer when he taught us and forgive us our sins for we also forgive everyone 
who is indebted to us. These words of the master to his servant still ring in our ears. You wicked servant, I forgave all your debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? The story is told of a gentleman who once went to Sir Gardley Wilmot, a Christian knight, in great wrath and indignation at an injury he had received from a person high in power and which he was meditating how to resent in the most effectual manner. Having related the particulars of the insult, he asked Sir Gardley if it would not be manly to resent it. And Sir Gardley, the Christian knight, responded, yes, it would be manly to resent it, but it would be godlike to forgive it. It is very likely that we come closest to imitating the Spirit of Christ when we forgive our neighbor as we do ourselves. And as we consider these parables, we learn that God expects us to approach him in full assurance that he is willing and also able to answer our prayers. He may delay sometimes, but that is no indication that he doesn't hear and that he's not able. And God is more concerned with the attitudes of our hearts than he is with the length or the number of our prayers. And God expects us to be honest with him and not to use our prayers as an opportunity to call his attention to our own goodness. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we do thank you and we praise you for your goodness and your mercy that we see again and again throughout Scripture. And as we come before you, we pray that we come in the humble attitude of the publican and not in the haughty spirit of the Pharisee. And that we understand that we are in need of your forgiveness and that your forgiveness of us also should be a reminder that we should forgive our fellow man of their sins and their debts toward us. And so help us, Father, to live in this spirit of forgiveness. And help us, Father, to, to look into your word and to order our steps according to the precepts and the examples that you have placed before us there. As we consider these parables today. We're so thankful that we do not have an unjust and an unconcerned judge, but we have a righteous and divine God who does care for us and who is concerned for us. And may we understand that it's not the length of our prayers or the number of our prayers that really matters, so much as it is our hearts and the spirit in which we come before you. And so help us, Father, to always approach you with all humility and with meekness of heart, realizing that we are in need of your forgiveness. And help us to remember, Father, that as we forgive others, so you forgive us. We do thank you, Father, for your mercy and your grace and for the hope that is ours in Christ that one day you are coming again and that you will bring your reward with you and that all of us who live godly in Christ Jesus can anticipate that day with great joy and great confidence. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we pray that you will have a good rest of this week 
and that whatever is happening in your life, that no matter how hopeless sometimes may seem, that nonetheless, there is a God in whom we trust that we know loves us and hears our petitions and our prayers, and he will answer us in his time. May God be with you until we meet again. God bless you. When I survey the wondrous cross On which the Prince of Glory died My richest gain I count but loss And more contempt Amen.